Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first poll installment of the Journal Club series, A Closer Look. Uh, and this is hosted by uh, myself, Amirian Buganza de Poli at Purdue University, Emma Lejun, Boston University, Manuel Rausch uh, from UT Austin, uh, Johannes Bachemeyer from Stevens Institute of Technology, and we have Matt Bercy from Butterville, but he's not in the call today. And today for our first uh, journal club of the fall, we have Francisco Sali Costaba, who got his PhD from Stanford University before joining as an assistant professor at the Pontifica Universidad Católica de Chile. And we were lab mates very briefly, I'm gonna say like a year, I don't know if a year or more, I think a year. Yep. And he does amazing work on applying machine learning techniques to biomedical engineering problems, in particular uh, cardiovascular mechanics. And so what he's gonna talk about today is a little bit of the work on Gaussian process classification for uh, atrial fibrillation. And that's it, the floor is yours, Francisco. Yes, thanks. Thanks for the introduction and the invitation. So this work is actually a, a big collaboration between a group in Switzerland, in Universidad de la Svizzera Italiana, and also with uh, Paris Perdicaris from UPenn. And I wanted to, I will present this paper that we uh, published uh, this year, but I also wanted to make this talk a bit more general about multifidelity Gaussian process classification, which is a topic that I have been working for the last uh, couple of years. So in the in the classical machine learning setting, um, we have the classification is just dis distinguishing between uh, two uh, binary uh, variables. So the classical example is a, a recognize, recognizing a cat versus a dog in a picture, and we can use this uh, many many techniques like convolutional neural networks, for example. But there are also some classification problems in computational models, and that's what, what I will what I will be talking about uh, today. So, for example, in a in a dynamical system, we can have uh, bifurcations where, uh, with some parameters, my system will show no oscillations. But if I tweak those parameters, I will jump uh, to a regime where I where I will show oscillations. And this will this is a bifurcation diagram, and in general, I need to compute this just by running my model at every combination of uh, these parameters, which can be really expensive. So from a mechanical perspective, this is uh, work, work from Emma's group. Uh, we can also see buckling uh, as, a, as a bifurcation problem, where here uh, they are trying to classify if the, if the column buckles left or right. And we, we were motivated to work on this uh, mainly uh, from the, uh, from uh, the studying drug, in, drug induced arrhythmias, where we have um, a heart with, with, with no drug, where you can see that the activation is periodic. And if we apply a drug, which means changing some parameters in our model, in our model we see uh, that the heart develops an arrhythmia. And actually, this movie was done by Matthias Perling, who is also in, in this call. Um, so, our goal with, with multi-fidelity uh, Gaussian process classification is to predict the binary output of an expensive computer model as accurately as possible at the lowest computational cost. And for that, we're going to use a couple of, of concepts that I will be repeating quite a lot during the talk that I wanted to introduce. And the first one is, is multi-fidelity. And the idea here is that we can take advantage of some inexpensive model uh, alternatives that may have some error, but still capture the physical phenomena that we want to model. So for example, we can run a finite element simulation with a coarser mesh that we know is not accurate, but we st it still produces the, the same output, for example. And this is typically, we can get a model that is around 10 times faster than the original model just by coarsening the mesh. Um, we can also reduce the, the dimensions of the model. So for example, we can take a 3D model and make it 1D or 0D. And that is typically a lot faster and we can get the speed ups of about a uh, hundred times or 1000 times. And I will show you examples of these two strategies. Another concept, concept is active learning, where we want to run our model at the locations in our uh, input parameter space that will provide us the most information 
or uh, or that will reduce or, or improve the accuracy of, of our prediction the most. So we don't want to random sample uh, uh, sampling randomly in our uh, input parameter space, but we want to be uh, really smart about how we do that. And finally, a Gaussian process, uh, why we chose these machine learning techniques, there are uh, many others, and we, we use this one, especially because they are really, really good when we have very few data points. Um, and we also have uh, predictions with uncertainty, and that will really help, help with the, with the active, active learning. So I wanted to give a brief introduction to what is a Gaussian process, if you have not seen this concept before. So I would guess that most of you are familiar with a normal distribution, which is parameterized with a, with a mean parameter and a standard deviation or variance parameter. And if we have, and this, this, this distribution is uh, defined on, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> only for one variable. If we um, if we take two variables that can we can have a bivariate normal distribution, and it is in this case we'll have a, a vector of means and a covariance matrix. And if we put zeros in the off-diagonal terms, this will mean that the variables are not correlated. But if we put some values that are not zero, we'll have a correlation between these uh, two random variables. So for example, here. Uh, this probability density function, what it's telling us is that if we have a higher value of uh, x1, it's more likely that we will also get a higher value of x2. Now, the, the idea of Gaussian process is to take these vectors and covariance matrices to infinite dimensions. So instead of having a vector of, of means, we'll have a function that, given some input location x, will give us the mean and some a covariance a function instead of a covariance matrix that given two input locations will tell me how correlated are these two, uh, two, these two variables. And this is typically called a kernel function that will depend on some parameters uh, theta. So I will first introduce Gaussian process regression because it's um, a lot simpler to, to understand and go from there to classification. And the goal of regression is given some data set of data pairs x and y. We want to find a predictive function f of x that will give me approximate, approximately a y a plus, plus some error. So the way we do Gaussian process regression is that we place a prior on, the, on this function f. So we say this function f is a Gaussian process we can impose a mean. In this case, we are saying this function has a zero mean, uh, but it has some characteristics, especially a smoothness, or is periodic, or it's not periodic, and um, that will give me some uh, a space of 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 uh, viable functions that I can use to uh, to fit this data. And here we have a an example of we're using a square exponential kernel, and these are candidate functions uh, that I can use to fit my data. Then I can condition these sort of observation, these functions on, on observations. So I have data points y, and I can make this function pass approximately by these points um, y. And the nice thing about Gaussian process is that if we as assume a Gaussian likelihood, uh, the posterior distribution, so the curves that are here, is also Gaussian, and we have a closed form for the mean of this distribution which you can see here is actually a linear combination of the, of the data. And we also have a, a prediction of the variance. So you can see here that for, for each point in, in X, I have multiple predictions. And that, that actually, if I cut here, it will be exactly a Gaussian distribution, which has a mean and a, and a variance. So these are really, really nice properties of Gaussian pro processes. Now, so far, we haven't done any learning. This is just some linear algebra that I need to do to uh, compute these results. But in general, we don't know the parameters of the kernel that typically determine the length scale of the data, and we need to optimize them. And this that is typically done, done uh, maxim maximizing the marginal likelihood, which is a uh, closed form expression that I can just optimize, and it's really, really fast uh, to do. Now, in the classification setting, I have something very similar. The only difference is that now my, my 
my y variable is either zero or one. It's not a continuous variable. So in this case, we will define uh, also a Gaussian process as a latent function. But the problem is that this function produces real numbers, and I need uh, probabilities. So what I'm going to do is to pass this latent function through something like a sigmoid function that will constrain it between 0 and 1. So here you can see samples of the latent function. And then I pass it through this function pi and that squishes the output between uh, 0 and 1. So I will always get some meaningful probability. Um, then we need to define the likelihood of our data, which is in this case is Bernoulli. So it's like flipping a coin. It's either zero or one with some uh, probability p. And I will actually try to predict this probability p, which is based on this function pi. So then we can apply a base rule and using the, the assumptions that we have. Um, we have a, a Gaussian prior, but our likelihood is actually Bernoulli. Then when we multiply these two, we, this is no longer Gaussian, and we cannot use uh, the marginal likelihood expression that we have before. And so we need to do some approximation to the, the inference and to learn the parameters of the, of the kernel. So now going to multi-fidelity classification. Now our, our data set looks a bit more complicated. We have uh, some low fidelity data, uh, data pairs uh, XL and YL, and some high fidelity data. Typically, we will have much more low fidelity data than high fidelity data. And these are also why it's also uh, between zero and one for both cases. And now we will have two uh, probability um, functions and two uh, Latin functions. But we're going to postulate some relationship between the low fidelity and high fidelity functions. So we're going to say that the high fidelity Latin function is the low fidelity multiplied by some scalar plus some delta function that will explain the discrepancy between the low and high uh, fidelity models. So now we place the Gaussian process priors not on the high fidelity latent function, but on the low fidelity latent function and the delta function that explains, explains the, the difference. The nice thing about postulating this model is that we can actually get a, a joint distribution for the high fidelity and low fidelity latent functions that is actually normal and it's also a Gaussian process. And it will have this uh, block covariance uh, structure that we can compute uh, just from the, the kernels and, the, and this parameter row. So in this case, we use the square exponential uh, kernel with automatic at relevance determination. That means that we can have different length scales in different directions in the different axis of our uh, input space. And we do the inference because we need to do approximate inference. We do it with, um, with Markov chain Monte Carlo. And that means that we need to specify some priors for the kernel parameters. So another thing that we developed for this classifier is active learning. And here we would like to, uh, to train our classifier with the fewest amount of points uh, to reconstruct the classification boundary. And to, to do this, we, we will run the model at the input locations that we expect to give us the most information. And here's the, how this works. So we train our classifier with some initial data set. So we randomly sample some points, usually 10 or something like that, points in our input space, and we train a classifier. And then we find the next point where we will run our model in by solving this, um, this minimization problem um, that says that I need to uh, find the point with the lowest mean of the latent function and the highest variance. So here I have an example. So this, what this is saying, uh, if I have a zero mean of the Latin function, when I pass that through the sigma function, it will be, give me a probability of 0 0.5. So it's looking for points that are exactly where I don't know if this will be classified either as zero or as one. And uh, it's also looking for, for points of high variance. So in this case, it will pick this point because it's really near the, the, the decision boundary. And you can see that it has a highest variance than this point here that is also in the decision boundary. 
And we will typically do this on some discrete locations, uh, evaluate this, this metric for a couple of points and select the, the minimum. Then we will run the, the computer model at this new input location and append this, this new data to our original data set and run the classifier again. So I have a, an example here of cardiac electrophysiology, um, which you might have seen, uh, which we can that is we that we can create the spiral waste on on on, uh, on cardiac tissue. So here I have a planar wave that I will perturb with some stimulus that is coming now, and you can see that I can uh, initiate an, an a spiral wave that typically will uh, run for. Uh, forever if I don't do anything. Now the timing of this uh, of this stimulus will be my my parameter and the discrete output will be whether I can induce a spiral wave or not. So here I have an example where I apply the stimulus too early and you can see that the stimulus disappears and now I have an example where I apply it too late and I create a, another planar wave that is not a spiral wave. So I can also do something similar in 1D, where if I apply the stimulus at the correct time, I will create a wave that is propagating backward. If I apply it too early, nothing will happen. The stimulus will just disappear. And if I apply it too late, I will create uh, two waves, that, which is what is happening here. So we created, we created a, a data set where we have um, where we vary the time that we apply this impulse and also some model parameter, uh, which is called B. And you can see here we have the test data for the uh, low fidelity for the cable. And you can see that is a slightly different that, than the data set of the, of the high fidelity, because there is some red region that is not present in the high fidelity model, but it's present in the low fidelity model. So we start with some randomly sampled points, which are the same for a single fidelity classifier. That is a classifier that doesn't see the low fidelity data and a multi-fidelity classifier, which already knows a low fidelity data. And you can see that even with these very few points, the multi-fidelity classifier has a good idea of where this red region is located. And but it got some, re, uh, some, some parts that come from the low fidelity region, which are not present, and it needs to learn that that, that actually doesn't go there. So we can run the, the active learning um, for 50 iterations. And you can see that the classifier tends to uh, put all the samples near the, the classification boundary. And it made that red blob that uh, was there at the beginning disappear. Um, so we can very efficiently uh, identify this red region, and you can see in this large blue space there are almost no samples. And if we compare the accuracies for this example, actually we get 100% accuracy for the multi-fidelity classifier versus around 80 for the for the single fidelity classifier. So we also did some work uh, using these classifiers classifiers with uh, Matthias Perling and Ellen Kuhl. Uh, where we try to identify the differences in drug induced arrhythmias uh, for male and female. In that case, our, we had a full biventricular uh, cardiac electrophysiology model uh, as a high fidelity model, and our low fidelity model was uh, just a single cell of that heart. So the, the speed up was quite dramatic. And from here, we can get an electrocardiogram where we can check if this model is exhibiting or not an arrhythmia. And at the cell level, we can just see the transmembrane potential and see if this cell shows or not early after depolarizations, which are known to be associated with this type of arrhythmia. And then we can do these multi-fidelity classifiers for male and female. And here we have the, the results. Um, we have that for the, um, basically this, the colored region and shows the, the, the region where I can induce an arrhythmia for plugging two different ion channels in my model. And you can see that for males is much smaller than for females. So we think that a female should be at more risk of, in, of getting this drug induced arrhythmias for certain drugs. And another interesting thing that you can see here is that 
uh, the agreement between claiming al, al, just a low fidelity uh, classifier, which is shown with the dashed lines, and uh, the, the multi fidelity. And you can see for the male case, they are actually super uh, similar. Uh, in, and in, in this case, it makes a lot of sense to use the, the cells as a low fidelity approximation. And for the female, we, we see more discrepancy, but we still can capture that there are, for example, just two regions, and then the, we can also capture just the, the shape of the region. So it still makes a lot of sense to use the, the low fidelity uh, approximation. Francisco, can I ask a quick question? Yes. I was curious, what, what makes one model female and the other one male? What is the difference in these models? Yeah, so there are uh, multiple differences. So here, one visual that you can see here is that the female heart is smaller. And we also applied a lot of changes in the cellular model uh, because of different ion expressions uh, for male and female. And so we actually have different cellular models and, uh, and also we changed the, the conductivity of the tissue. Uh, so yeah, to adjust for the different conduction velocities in male and female. Thank you, appreciate it. So now a uh, uh, more abstract question is, uh, and is what if our input domain is not square? So I just show you two, two examples where my input domain is just a, a square. But what happens if my input domain is something really complicated like the, for example, the surface of this bunny that, that I'm showing here? The problem here is that in the in the in, when we compute the the kernel function, so to to obtain the correlation, it typically depends on the distance between points. Uh, so if I'm in a square and I have two points, I can just compute the Euclidean distance, and I can input that to my kernel, and it will tell me how correlated are these two points. But in a bunny, uh, if I have two uh, points that are in the tip of the ears and I just compute the Euclidean distance, that is actually uh, not, not correct because even though these points might be close in the, in the Euclidean space, they are actually not that close if we uh, need to go through the, through the surface. So this is a, an abstract question, but it's, it's actually something that we encounter in, in cardiac electrophysiology. So for example, um, in a procedure that is actually done in patients is to pace from different locations. So a physician will put a catheter inside the heart and apply an electrical stimulus to uh, excite the electrical waves in the heart. Um, and we can, of course, also do that computationally. So here we're, we're pacing from this location. We're pacing uh, multiple times in this period of time here. And we see that we uh, obtain uh, atrial fibrillation for this case. So because we stop pacing and the activation uh, still continues, so we will have uh, multiple spiral waves that uh, uh, occur in this uh, in this uh, uh, in this atrial geometry. But we can also pace from another location. For example, here where we have the star, and after we st we stop pacing, uh, the activation disappears. And you can see here because the electrocardiogram is actually flat. So we stop pacing and the activity uh, uh, stop. So that would mean that I don't have any uh, fibrillation here. <clears throat> now the input domain is actually the atrial surface. It's not a square. So I need to do something else to uh, use my classifier here. So from, from pacing from different locations, I can actually uh, get an, in, an inducibility map which will tell me for every point in my atrial surface whether I'm inducing AF or not. So for example, here, the blue region means that, I, that if I pace from that location, I will not get an arrhythmia. And the red region means that if I pace from that location, I will induce an arrhythmia. And this, this type of maps are used to evaluate the efficacy of, of treatments such as ablation uh, before we do the procedure. We, I would like to try some different ablation strategies to see if this will reduce the amount of tissue that where I can induce uh, the arrhythmia. And actually, we can just condense this map in one metric where I just compute the area of the, of the red region, and that will tell me how much uh, tissue I can induce the arrhythmia, and I would like to uh, lower that uh, 
the, in, uh, the area of that tissue. Um, typically there, they can be really expensive to evaluate because I need to run many, many simulations just for one case to evaluate this metric. Yes, Manu? Uh, sorry, quick question. The, your tissue properties, are they homogeneous or are they heterogeneous? Uh, in this model? Yeah. They are heterogeneous. Uh, I will show in a bit uh, exactly okay. how heterogeneous they are. Um, but they have some fiber orientation and the con uh, conductivity also changes. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Okay, so our approach is that we, we will place a Gaussian process prior in, in the atrial geometry using the Laplacian eigenfunctions that I will explain in a minute what they are. And for as our data set, we will paste from different locations in our uh, atrial model, and we will have a high fidelity model, which has a, an adequate mesh and, a, and a, an adequate time step, but we will create a low fidelity model, which, which has a coarser mesh. And I will paste from different locations and check if the, I can induce an arrhythmia or not at each of those locations. I will create my data set, and using uh, this thing, this multi field classifier, I will uh, create a, a, an, an inducibility map that I can evaluate at every point in my in my atrial surface. So, how how can we compute the kernel in the atrial surface? Um, so, for this, we will use the eigenfunctions of the Laplace Bertrami operator. Uh, which come from uh, solving this uh, particular problem here, uh, which says that the Laplacian of the function must be equal to some uh, value, scalar value times the, the function. And we also impose uh, Newman boundary conditions uh, at the boundaries. Um, this sounds very abstract, but if you actually take a look at a, a 1D example, um, you can formulate just that the secondary derivative of the minus the secondary derivative of the function must be equal to the uh, some scalar times the function, and we also have these boundary conditions. So, can anyone think of a function that will satisfy this from differential equation class? Maybe. No. Our semester okay. hasn't started yet. That's my excuse. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but if we we if we just plug in cosine the cosine function, we check that the the secondary value of the cosine function is minus cosine times some some constants that depends on what's coming in here. So actually, the, the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian in one D are just a cosine functions of increasing frequency. But I just need to make sure that always the derivative is zero at the beginning and at the end. So here I'm just plotting the first function, which is just a constant with i equals zero, then the first one, and the second one, the third one, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see that they just increase in frequency. And I can do the same for my geometry. And here I have the first function, which is a constant, then the 10th function, which has some oscillations, and then the function number 100, has higher frequency oscillations, and the 1000 has even higher frequency uh, oscillations. So why do I need these functions? Because um, there is a theorem that shows that you can compute a modern kernel, which is something, uh, is a very popular uh, kernel for Gaussian processes, just by um, evaluating these uh, eigenfunctions and different input locations and multiply them. Um, by, and making this sum that depends on the eigenvalues and the parameters of the kernel. And we can also compute the, uh, the Gaussian process prior directly as a linear combination uh, of the eigenfunctions uh, times some uh, weight that is random and will be normally distributed. And actually this accelerated our code uh, quite a bit using this, this formulation here. So how can we compute the Laplace uh, Beltrami operator um, in, in this complex geometry? Uh, we can approximate it with finite elements, um, just linear finite elements. Uh, this is typically called the, sometimes it's called the stiffness matrix, and this is called the mass matrix. And this will be my shape functions. And I then with those matrices, I can compute a generalized eigenvalue problem. And I will obtain this, uh, the eigenvectors B, and then I can approximate my Laplacian eigenfunctions at uh, the point x 
uh, j as the uh, eigen, uh, eigenvector uh, evaluated at the nodal position j. So I, I converted this problem into a discrete problem that I can do for any triangular mesh. So now the, the setup is exactly the same as I showed you before. The only thing that we change is that now we compute the kernel with a, with a matter kernel on the surface, but everything else remains exactly the same. So I wanted, I wanted to show you first a synthetic example where we create different random fields. So this will be only single fidelity. We don't have a, a low fidelity uh, model here. And we are um, increasing the length scale of the random field. So you can see here that it has like really small features. And as we increase the length scale, the features become high, uh, larger and larger. We also train a nearest neighbor uh, classifier to have a, a benchmark where I will just assign um, the, the same uh, output as the closest point in, in geodesic distance. Um, we also train a Gaussian process classifier with a fixed design. So that means that all the input locations are the same uh, all the time and one week with active learning. And you can see that for the, for the large length scales, all the classifiers work relatively okay. And for example, here we can see that the, the active learning can learn this feature here. Uh, that is uh, here in the ground truth, but it disappears in the fixed design. But for example, if we go to the smallest length scales, we can see that the active learning starts to fail. Here, there's a feature in the ground truth that is uh, completely missed by, by the active learning. So we can see that the, as the length scale uh, it decreases, the performance of all the classifiers decline because the problem becomes uh, a lot harder. There are more classification boundaries to, to be learned. And actually, if we compare the, the accuracy improvement between using a, just a Gaussian process uh, classifier trained on the same points as the nearest neighbor, we can see that we have pretty much always uh, an improvement just by using this different classify, classifier, although the improvement is not that big. But you can see if we go to the smallest length scales, it doesn't improve uh, almost anything. Now, if we compare the Gaussian process classifier with active learning versus the nearest neighbor, we can see that for the large length scale, we have a lot of improvement. Um, but if we go to the lowest length scales, we actually have a decrease in performance. And we can summarize this um, in this plot where we show the length, length scale here uh, versus, the, um, versus the accuracy when, with 100 samples. And you can see that active learning is actually always better than the other two alternatives, except when I uh, go from to a length scale of 0 0.2. And actually what we found is that the, the average distance between training points, which is this line here, um, corresponds roughly to 0 0.38. So we, when we have a length scales that are lower than that distance, um, I, my, my accuracy decreases quite a bit. And what is happening is that sometimes in between to uh, training points, there could be another uh, classification boundary that I cannot detect with, with that amount of data. <laughs> so now going to the atrial fibrillation model, we have um, different, uh, we have nine different cases. We always use the same geometry, but we have um, different fibrotic patterns. We have three different fibrotic patterns. So here, fibrosis will mean that the conduction uh, of the electrical wave is reduced in the, uh, in, in, the, in the gray points. And we also try three different ablation strategies. So one is no ablation. And the second one is pulmonary vein isolation, where I will uh, burn this piece of tissue so it doesn't conduct the electricity. Um, the, the last one is box isolation, which uh, includes the PVI, the pulmonary vein isolation, plus these two uh, green lines. So going back to your question, Manu, we have a, a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, you can see here, and uh, this is actually, we generate this with a random field. And uh, actually, we also have the anisotropy, anis anisotropy of, the, of, the, of the tissue that I'm not showing here. <clears throat> 
So for the high field model, we use an element size of 0 0.2 millimeters and a time step of 0 0.01 milliseconds. And we double that uh, for the low field model, both the element size of the, and the time step. Um, and the run times, uh, the, the low field model is roughly 16 times faster than the high field model. And we run uh, 100 simulations for training and 100 simulations for testing and 100 simulation for the low field for each of the model. So we end up with uh, many, many simulations and we, we use around 25,000 25, load hours in the uh, Swiss uh, supercomputer uh, center. So the, now showing some results. So here are the train points. So you can see if red, it means that I was able to induce an arrhythmia there or blue means that I, I didn't. And here is the low fidelity train classifier that you can see doesn't completely agree with the with the high fidelity. For example, here there is a red point that is misclassified um, because here I'm actually showing the test points. So this is an independent set that I reserved just to evaluate the accuracy of the classifier. And then we can see the nearest neighbor classifier trained with 50 samples and then with 100 samples. And we can see that it tends to, to change um, quite a lot depending on the training data um, because it doesn't have much uh, capacity to interpolate. Uh, if we use single fidelity, so this only sees the, the high fidelity data, we see that it also changes. Uh, for example, there is a feature here that then disappears when I have 100 samples. Um, but actually, it, it got that wrong because here there's a blue point that should be classified as, as blue, but it's, it's classified as red. And if we use the uh, multi fidelity uh, classifier, we can see that it looks with 50 samples, it looks quite a lot like the low fidelity classifier, and it, that it doesn't change much between uh, five, 50 and 100 samples. Um, but it, it, it can correct, for example, this red point is misclassified in the in the low PLED, but now it's correctly classified in the high PLED, in the multi PLED classifier. Now, if we look at this more quant uh, quantitatively, um, we can see, we, here we have the balance accuracy for different um, number of, of samples. Um, so we can see that uh, when we have a uh, only a few samples, we, we, the, the multi fidelity tends to be better. And here the dashed line represents the accuracy of the, of the low fidelity classifier. So if we did this for all nine cases. And first, what you can notice is that this dashed line is always above the, the, um, the, classic, the red and, and black lines, which, which are the single fidelity and nearest neighbor classifiers. And so that means that even using it, maybe it's better to use just a low fidelity classifier with more samples than using a high fidelity classifier with less samples. And this is like the, the baseline for the multi fidelity classifier. The multi fidelity classifier will always be above the low fidelity classifier um, because it has all that information and, and it also has some information about the high fidelity model. So we can see that in general, for low uh, sample, uh, uh, for a low amount of, of samples, we can get um, we can we can get a better uh, estimation with the multi fidelity classifier. And here we we to uh, we look when we have uh, forty samples, and you can see that for all cases using the multi fidelity classifier um, actually improves the results. Um, so. And looking at the agreement between the high and low fidelity, we can see that they tend to agree quite a bit. So if the high fidelity says that there is no AF, um, the low fidelity will also say that. But the, the low fidelity ten, tends to fail to predict some cases of atrial fibrillation. Uh, and that means that is less inducible. And I really, really briefly wanted to talk about something else that we can also use this technique to, to do an inverse problem uh, of what we just did. So if I give you an, electro, an electrocardiogram, can you tell me where you were pacing? And this, is, this has some applications in ventricular tachycardia, for example. 
And we do uh, something um, very similar. We also use the Laplace weight Bertrami eigenfunction to uh, predict the, um, in this case, the, uh, the loss function of an optimization problem. Um, but our model now consists that if I paste from a location, I will produce an ACG, and I will also have some data on that, on that ACG. <clears throat> so now we can, we can do Bayesian optimization here. And the bottom line here is that uh, if I use a, a multi-fidelity classifier, I can reach the minimum, which is shown here with a star in, with much lower samples than uh, using just a single single fidelity. Um, this is because we have a very good agreement between a low and high uh, fidelity in this case. You can see that the uh, black and red curves are very aligned. And if we repeat this experiment many times, uh, you can see that with the multi-fidelity classifier, we all, always need a cost of uh, less than 20 to find the minimum. Whereas if we use the single fidelity classifier, the single fidelity method, we uh, sometimes need a lot more than that. So to summarize, um, we have developed a multi-fidelity classifier that uh, always works better than uh, the single fidelity counterpart. Uh, we can also use active learning to, um, to maximize the information that we gain with, with each sample. We also extended this classifier to work on surfaces, and we can use this classifier to compute inducibility maps. And of course, this is not restricted to the heart. I show mostly applications on the heart, but you can apply it to other things as well. So we can, as future work, we can also extend this method to work on, on solids, just not, not on surfaces, because we can also compute the Laplacian there. Um, and we would also like to incorporate some information about the fibrotic patterns in how the way that we compute the kernel. And you can find all the code here uh, for all the three different applications that I uh, showed. And um, with that, I'd like to end. Thanks. Visual clap. Thank you so much, Francisco. That was super interesting and a lot of information. And open it up for questions. Questions, questions. Yeah, Manu. Thank you. Um, I can only second what Adrian said. I really appreciate that. I especially appreciated the quick introduction on uh, um, Gaussian process regression and um, a quick reminder for those of us that may have forgotten. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, I have a question that's a very general question, but I, I always ask that when I see machine learning talks, where do you sort of see an envision um, where, where this takes you or where you sort of like um, push forward um, the envelope and, and sort of clinical practice? I, I like the inverse element. I see, I see sort of a very clear application of that. Um, what was sort of the motivation that started you on this? And, and um, how do you think machine learning really elevates this beyond sort of the, the work that's been done before? Um, yes, that's a great question. So uh, the, the inducibility maps are currently used in or trying to be used in clinical practice. So they actually try to optimize different ablation treatments based on these inducibility maps. So I think the application of this is actually very straightforward because what we are doing is we are just computing the inducibility map. Uh, with, uh, you can either fix the cost and we make it more accurate, or you can reduce the cost and we maintain the accuracy. So we are just trying to make that metric that is used in clinical pra practice um, to make it um, more efficient, just a more efficient way to compute that. So I think in that sense, it's, it's really straightforward. And so that, so it's way, not like, I don't, oh. there's like no issues of uh, interpretability or things like that, because we, I mean, it's just a classifier and you can see the entire output is really clean. And so then you basically leverage the upfront cost because it was pretty costly, right? The, 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 the training, the 25,000 um, um, <laughs> hours or whatever you had, you had uh, invested. So you then leverage the a priori cost 
basically accelerate sort of a pre-surgical planning? So, yeah, so for now they will run 40 sim simulations to compute the indisability map. So what I'm telling you is that if you spend that, that, that same budget, I can give you a more accurate uh, inducibility map because the multifidelity classifier doesn't take that long to, to train. So that's the, the idea. Then how applicable is this to other geometries, say, right? Because if you did this in a patient-specific way, um, obviously every patient has a different atrium. Um, and then aside from the fact, I guess, that you know, there is some cost associated with discretizing the geometry and, and sort of making that suitable, um, how, how well is this going to work on another patient? Like, do you have to redo all the a priori work or is this quite applicable? Yes. Yes. I mean, this is just for one case. So we, we need to compute the Laplacian eigenfunctions, everything for the other geometry. But the nice thing is that if you're running the, the model, you already have the geometry. So it's kind of like a side product of the, of the pipeline. We, we don't need to do many more steps to, to do this. I guess I have a follow up on that. Uh, is there a way of doing some of the using either a machine learning technique or some way of translating from this geometry to a new geometry without having to recompute the whole thing? Yes, uh, we are working on that, uh, but it's still very preliminary. And uh, yeah, but it has to do something with like shape descriptors and how you can represent like a point in the in the atria. And how is that similar to a point in someone else, a, a person? Um, and there are some really cool things that you can do there, and we are definitely working on that. Yeah. Awesome. Other questions? Yes, Emma. Yeah, um, on, a, on a similar note, well, well, first of all, Francisco, great talk, and, and thanks for including the intro slides at the beginning. Um, those are helpful for getting everyone to, to be able to follow through the whole thing. Especially um, yours. Well, especially me. Especially yours, your slides. <laughs> yeah, um, but, oh yeah, oh, you mean especially the one that included a picture from my group? Yeah, that's my favorite slide. <laughs> that should be. No. Um, but so as a follow up on, on your previous on, on Adrian's question, and this is completely just a curiosity, um, have you found any analogous problems um, in like geostatistics or spatial statistics? Because um, I know that like a lot of um, work in Gaussian processes um, has originated um, sort of in the geostatistics research community. Um, and I was just wondering, like, are, are there any like problems that you've thought about that are analogous? I'm I'm. I have no idea. I... <laughs> yeah, so, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, I, you always need to find some analogous problems for the introduction, I guess. <laughs> to put in. Uh, so, but I actually haven't found, so I, I think the heart is pretty special um, because of the of this bifurcation that you can have that is not so typical. Um, so for example, in mechanics, um, sometimes you can just translate the problem into a regression problem where you just like break the, I don't know, the critical force or, or things like that. But mm -hmm. here in the heart is really like a discrete uh, problem where you, if you tick the parameters a little bit, you can get a completely different result in the model. Um, so yeah, I, I know like a lot of work of regression was done in the, in the geoscience field. Um, but actually what happened to me is that I couldn't find a multifidelity uh, classifier. The, the, the multifidelity regression was proposed in the 2000, in the year 2000. So it's actually quite old, but nobody has done uh, multifidelity classification because I don't think it's a super common problem, especially uh, it might be like super niche to the heart, but maybe there are some other applications that I'm missing. I, I will be, it will be really great to find them. Hmm. Yeah, that, that completely makes sense. Um, thank you. Hmm. Yeah, um, I have one other question if, if there isn't anyone else who wants to jump in. Um, in the example that you showed here, you were able to come up with a low fidelity simulation that seemed at least just based on what I'm seeing on the slides um, to be pretty highly correlated with your high fidelity simulation. Um, yeah. And I think that that sort of concept is just something that's really interesting to me, like choosing what the low fidelity simulation should be, I think is is a really important part of, of these types of work. 
Um, and I was wondering if you kind of had any thoughts on, on that process um, or how you sort of um, went about it in the past. Like, did you just try out the 1D simulation and got lucky that it, it, it was meaningful to the 2D simulation or was there a more informed process behind it? Um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that's a great question because I think like we, we started doing multi-fidelity regression. I think like the, the rule of thumb is that you need a model, low fidelity model that needs to be at least 100 times faster than your high fidelity model. And that sometimes is really tricky to find. Um, but what we found in classification is actually that if you have a model that is only about 10 times faster and something that you can easily do with just making the mesh coarser of a finite element, that still helps quite a bit. So for the classification case, I think it's much easier to create a low fidelity model just by coarsening the mesh of your finite element model and not doing the, the dimension reduction, which sometimes is really tricky to do um, in, in some physics. So yeah, I think the requirements for speed up in, in classification are much lower. That makes sense. Yeah. And I guess coarsening the mesh is, is sort of the maybe the intuitive first thing that, that one would try if you have a high fidelity simulation that, that you're happy with. Is that sort of your experience? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, that that will be enough for these cases, I think. Um, yeah, sometimes making, for, for example, an arrhythmia doesn't appear in 1D or 0D. Uh, so you need to do, have some kind of tissue. Actually, we tried in this case to do some kind of 2D simulations and it didn't work out. It was much easier to just course in the model and that was, that was fine. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, so Adrian um, actually just texted me. He has to go teach. Um, so I'm taking over as, as, um, as moderating questions. If anyone um, has any, any final questions, I think we have time for at least one more question if, if someone has something on their mind. Um, well, if there aren't any more questions from the audience, um, oh, Adrian says, thanks for sharing the code. Yeah, I, I definitely, um, I definitely want to check out those repositories and, and see, um, see what you've been doing there. Um, yeah, well, if there aren't any more, um, questions, um, from the, the audience, um, I'll go ahead and, and thank Francisco one more time, um, and stop recording and yeah. So thank you, Francisco.